the sun go down No, you're out there You catting around I got clothes Having it made But clothes only counts In horseshoes and hang grenades You put our love Up on the shelf When you gave your heart To someone else Thought I was close Thought I had it made But close only counts In horseshoes and hang grenades Summer and winter too. You gave your loving to someone new. I got clothes, haven't it made, but clothes only counts in horseshoes and angry. Tinsley Ellis. I'm from right here in Atlanta, Georgia, and I play blues guitar. Is, is it that simple, just blues guitar? Blues and folk. Yeah. Are you famous? No, not famous. It's been a long, hard climb to the middle. <laughs> it's like that ACDC song, but change some words up. Yeah. But you're a very well-respected musician. You're like a musician's musician. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, probably. I've been doing it in the Atlanta area since the 1970s. Mm-hmm. I was in college at uh, at Emory starting in 1975 and got out of college in 1979 and went immediately on the road in blues bands and been playing around ever since. And if, if you look up your name, you, you see your name next to legends. Allman Brothers, Derek Trucks. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, the list is huge. Who are some of the people you've worked with and shared the stage with? Well, pretty pretty much anyone from around here uh, that goes uh, between, you know, the the old guard of uh, Almond Brothers band and and uh, the making music and uh, right up through the modern era, the jam bands, Widespread Panic, and uh, and certainly the the newer guys like Eddie Ninevolt. And Eddie Ninevolt's a favorite of mine. He's a favorite of the podcast here at the Peace Jam Podcast, and he worked on the new record with you. He sure did. Uh, we used one of the songs on the album, uh, which is an old Sun House number, and it was a production of him uh, over at his studio. That's awesome. It started I love off that. as a demo, but he did such a good job charging me up and getting me fired up that uh, when I tried to record it in the studio, we liked the demo better, so we put that on the album. So the music that we've heard today is not exactly the music you've been playing since the 70s in the sense that this is really stripped down right so what what were you before what do you, or what do you normally do normally I, I guess it would be more uh hard rock and blues you know with a with a full band you know screaming lead guitar and uh and uh kind of loud you know and uh and now I'm kind of stripping it down and touring and recording uh in the format of uh, acoustic folk and blues and so let's talk about this guitar that you have, if you're not watching the video, this guitar is gorgeous. So please explain it to somebody who can't see it. Yeah, it's a, a 1937 National Steel guitar. And I guess back in the 1920s, 1930s, they had a, a craze of Hawaiian music. Uh, so you could, you're supposed to lay it on your lap and play kind of luau rock on it. And it's got some uh, palm trees etched in the front. And then, of course, on the back, it's got the really 
really pretty beach scene. And blues musicians got a hold of them probably around the same time these came out in the 20s and 30s, and we declared it a blues instrument because it makes a lot of racket, you know. And uh, and uh, it's a big part of it's always been a big part of my show. I used to do the stripped down sort of acoustic thing in the middle of the show. And so what I'm doing now is pretty much just a full extension of that. So you just you did a whole record of just you and this guitar. This guitar and also I've got a, a Martin guitar, a wooden guitar. Okay. Because no one would want to hear this all night. It's just uh I, I, you, you know what? It's pretty I'm, intense. I'm going really. to uh have to agree to disagree because I could listen to that <laughs> all night long. It's kinda like harmonica, a little bit goes a long way. I guess you know, and... maybe, but that's your opinion. I thought it's fantastic. <laughs> oh, so cool. it, will you give me kind of an example of how much noise you can make with that? Oh it's just it's see, it's got a pie tin in it and that kind of rattles before amp Amplification, that's how you would send the sound out. So it really rattles and sends the sound out, much like a banjo would do. But now, when I was listening to you play, so when we sit down and record this, you played a couple songs, and then we sit down to talk. So I've, I've heard the music, and it sounded like listening to like an old Sun House record. Like it sounded like something, some Delta Blues in... I imagine that's exactly what you were going for. Yeah, I've been listening to that music a long time. In the early 70s, you know, before I, I even moved up here from South Florida, uh, I was listening to the old Robert Johnson albums that were coming out of the time. Now, of course, you've got the Internet, so everything's available. Back then, you really had to seek out the old stuff. And, mm -hmm. and I was able to... Uh, you know, as a teenager, go see B.B. King, and I saw Muddy Waters several times and Howlin' Wolf. I went to Howlin' Wolf concert, and I was kind of the annoying kid that would follow the old blues guys around and ask them questions, and I want to get my picture made with them and, and get their autographs, of course. And then I, uh, you know, all played all through college and then uh, got a big chance to sign with Alligator Records in the 1980s, and they're the predominant uh, blues label in the world. So I went to Chicago and I backed up uh, around the time that I put out my first album on Alligator, which was called Georgia Blue. They wanted to play up the Georgia roots, which I was fine with. And I went to Chicago and back, backed up people like uh, oh, Buddy Guy and Otis Rush and Albert Collins, Coco Taylor, James Cotton, pretty much all the people on the Alligator roster. And now, unfortunately, they're all gone, you know, except for Buddy Guy and uh, and a few others. And uh so I had some really uh, good years playing around Chicago, and uh, but always keeping Georgia as a home base. And so that's what I mean when I asked you about wh whether you're famous or not, and if you're a musician's musician, because when you name these names, like if you've heard blues music, you've heard these people. Right. But your name, it, you never became that next level, and I don't know why. Do you know why? Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a need for my work to remain confidential or something is like that, that. It like is? a spy or something. But uh, I don't know. I'm out there, and I, I'm really grateful to have done nothing but music uh, from the time I uh, got out of college. And, uh, you know, I washed some dishes and stuff in restaurants, and I was— uh, Haven't we all? —worked in the <laughs> medical library at, at Emory shelving books, and that was my last job in— 1975, and they politely asked me to leave. And okay. So I was released on my own recognizance <laughs> and uh, got into playing in bands and stuff like that and always kept the blues as my love. And it wasn't until 1983 when Stevie Ray Vaughan came out. That's when the door kind of was swung open. He held the door open, and we all walked in right behind him. That's uh, that's fantastic. And I love that you've been able to do it full time. It, it is your job. It's your passion. And... It, it's who you are. And when I told people today, I was like, hey, Tinsley Ellis is coming in there. Really? <laughs> wow. He's still alive. <laughs> I, hope they, I hope they didn't say that. <laughs> no, people are excited <laughs> to have you be able to come in here because it's cool. It's cool that Atlanta in Georgia has somebody like you with the level of talent that you have, the pedigree that you have, and you're still – you know, changing things up and, and doing things a little bit different. I mean, the idea of making an album that is completely stripped down isn't revolutionary, but it's also not something that a lot of people do now. 
Well, there's also uh, an element of the show that I'm doing now is I am talking about how I wrote some of the songs, and a lot of my songs are written on acoustic instruments, and then I put them to the band format. So there's a lot of yak in there. I'm a talker, and so uh, telling some stories and some tall tales, and uh, like I, I mentioned earlier, a lot of name dropping, because, I mean, I never thought... I don't know too many people that saw Helen Wolf in concert, but I literally sat right at his feet and watched him play. The same with Muddy Waters and B.B. King and so wow. many of the others. Wow. What's the story you like to tell at parties? At parties? Yeah. This is a party, right? <laughs> sure. Well, I love to talk about the first time I uh, I heard about blues music. This friend of mine, he and I were in junior high school. We were listening to records in his room, something like... Uh, probably Allman Brothers at the Fillmore East, one of my favorite albums. And his older brother, he was a real know-it-all. He was like in 10th grade. And he came into the room and heard us listening to that album. And he said, uh, well, you know, um, I hear you guys listening to this Dwayne Allman and uh, and Cream and, you know, Eric Clapton. And uh, he goes, there's a guy coming to town y'all got to go see. Cause, and he's the one they're all getting this from. We said, who is it we got to go see? And he said, you got to go see B.B. King. So B.B. King did a, a teen show uh, near where I grew up, and uh, it was in North Miami Beach at a hotel. And this was at a time where B.B. King was playing hotel lounges for, mm -hmm. a, for a whole week. I mean, imagine going to see B.B. King every night in a little bar. But he was playing there at the Marco Polo Hotel in North Miami Beach. And I'll never forget the name of the I never forget the uh, name of the of the bar at the Marco Polo that he was booked into. A little place, he was booked into the Swingers Lounge, <laughs> a perfectly normal name for a nightclub back in the early of seventies. Yes. And uh, I actually didn't see any swinging going on there. I looked everywhere, but uh, BB was booked there, and he had to do a teen show on the Saturday afternoon. Where they shut down the bar and just serve soft drinks, and teenagers could come in there and hear the featured attraction. So my dad loaded up the station wagon and took some, me and my young friends down there, there to see this guy that was supposed to be the man. And you know what? He was the man. And I sat right there in the front, like literally at his feet, while he did his his uh, show, and I could see where Johnny Winter was coming from and Jimi Hendrix and, and seeing the real blues for the first time. And then B.B., greeted us in the lobby and talked to us for what seemed like hours. It's probably 20 or 30 minutes, but he was so friendly and so nice. So I got the idea that all blues musicians must be really friendly people, right? Well, the next guy I went to see was Howlin' Wolf. And Howlin' Wolf came off the stage, and, and if the B.B. King show, if it was PG-13, I will tell you that the Howlin' Wolf show was... It was a hard R, if not an X-rated show. He did all kind of <laughs> lewd gestures up there. and But I figure, you know, Mr. King was so nice, Mr. Wolf must be a nice man, too. So I'm going to go meet Howlin' Wolf. So he's standing off to the side of the stage talking to his band. And so I'm walking towards him. I'm, it's like 1972, and I'm 15 years old. You do the math. And I'm walking towards the Howlin' Wolf, and the closer I got to him, the bigger and meaner he looked. And I chickened out and went and got a Coca-Cola instead. <laughs> I never got to meet Howlin' Wolf. The new record uh, is out. And is it on vinyl? Like, this seems like it. it's one of those things that is primed for vinyl. Or is it only download? Like, tell me about it. Oh, it's all formats. You know, it's never been better for the listener than it is now. The store never closes. The store never runs out. Mm -hmm. Thanks to the Internet. So it's on vinyl, uh, CD, Download streaming, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, you know it's on colored vinyl too. It's on gold, trans gold metallic vinyl. So that's a selling point nowadays, I think. I think so. Well, all vinyl is colored, though. You, vinyl would look kind of like tar or something. Even a black vinyl is technically colored vinyl. So this is a cool looking album. <laughs> It's time to go I just can't take it no more It's time to leave You got bad tricks up your sleeve Here come the doom You put the devil in the room 
Put the devil in the room, y'all. 